are into that peace. When our mind is filled with disturbing thoughts and ideas that we can't seem to control, instead of trying to control them, let us surrender that mind into that peaceful field of awareness, that peaceful presence that by its very nature doesn't think, but is fully awake, fully alive in us. And so if we can lovingly turn off the channel of the talking mind, we move into another aspect of mind, which is the witness mind. And we rest and breathe into the witness mind. This is the mind in us that witnesses the thoughts that arise. And then we, as the awake one, choose whether we want to engage those thoughts or if we've had enough of that thought pattern. And so just like a cloud that would move through the sky of mind, we can let that thought pattern just move through our sky of mind. And it will leave us if we don't put our attention on it. So I want you to smile to your attention because your attention is now in the witness. I am witnessing thought and I'm also witnessing no thought. Uh, I had a toothache the other day and I was hearing Thich Nhat Hanh, remember the non-toothache. And after trying to breathe my way through the toothache, I took a Tylenol and the toothache disappeared. And I thought, ah, oh, I'm now in non-toothache mode. <laughs> So what if even without a Tylenol we can find that place without pain? Pain arises, it's a natural thing. Fear arises, it's a natural thing. Confusion arises, it's a natural thing. And yet we're just witnessing it rather than feeding off of it, which would be unnecessary suffering. And so you hear that ancient, ancient verity that says pain is a given but suffering is optional. Pain is a part of life. It's how we grow. That's why they call them growing pains. But suffering is, is when you decide to live in the identity with that pain and then become a long suffering individual or not. And the invitation is to say not. I'm not going to do that anymore. I don't need that suffering anymore. It doesn't serve me anymore. I'm choosing freedom. I'm choosing peace. And so from this witness mind, we find ourselves falling into this awake awareness. That which is always awake, that's fully present, that's sitting here right now, listening to my words, it's awake, but it's not thinking. It's not even observing. It's just being. It's being here, awake, and fully present. It's the foreground of our consciousness, whereas in the background are the nattering nabobs of negativity, but we're not putting our attention on them. So it's like a radio station, you can just turn it off. I'm not listening to you anymore. Ah, the wake awareness is still there, isn't it? How sweet is that? And so in this shift into freedom, into this natural flow that we're aspiring toward, which is our long-term intention, and our short-term intention would just to be here now breathing. They work together. And so this month we're speaking about waking up, that presence that wakes up within us. It's peaceful and loving and alive. And to live from being that, being open, being creative, 
being thirsty for truth, being pure in heart so that we can see God. And this week we're going to work on being human so we can take our attention within ourselves and we can embrace our humanity. We've discovered our divinity, the beingness of the universe through us. Now we get to embrace our humanity, the part of us that suffers, the part of us that is wounded, the part of us that needs to be held, not by the world, but by our own selves. And we can be fully human, then we can be fully divine. And so as we set our intention to investigate and to discover and to realize this presence, this something greater that has never abandoned us or forsaken us, we find ourselves held in the arms of grace, forever safe in the arms of love, like a child who needs protection from her mother's warm embrace. We are held in the embrace of love. Just feel that. We don't need to chase after it in the world because divine love herself, himself, is holding us with every breath, with every remembrance that we are that. We are that something that we have been seeking. It's right here, it's right now. And it will never leave us or abandon us or forsake us. The invitation is to trust in that. Ernest Holmes himself said, he who does not trust does not know God. And so the invitation is to trust in this essence that we all share, to trust in something as simple as the breath that is breathing us, to trust in the smile of a friend who you know is always there for you, to trust in life to bring us what we need for our soul's unfoldment and to trust in our soul to be receptive to the gifts of life, even the painful gifts. The soul doesn't choose only happy time. The soul says this painful time is here for me as well. And the soul says I will find meaning in whatever arises. And so the invitation in being human is to work with our soulful nature, ah, that eternal aspect of our being, an eternal soul that was never born and never dies. And to know ourselves as that, that even death is not the enemy because soul doesn't die. And to know ourselves as that, then we can die to everything else. We can die to all the illusions and all the stories we tell and all the narratives about the past and what went wrong and what didn't go, it's all gone now. It wasn't real to begin with. But what's real is smiling right now in your own heart. Feel that. That infinite presence that lies stretched in smiling repose at the center of our being. It's the same infinite presence. Mm. We're going to anchor ourselves in that presence for this brief time together. Uh, and we're going to come and open our eyes and explore the work of being human from the soul's perspective. You know, I love the work that we do here at the center because it's, to me, the greatest work of all. I need more sound. I need more sound. I can barely hear you. Uh, can we turn the sound up? Um, yes. Yeah, we'll do our best, Raul. Or I can speak up louder. I guess I'll put my acting voice on. So, how is everybody here? Is that, is that loud enough for you, folks? Whoop. I'm sorry I can't do that. That's just not going to work for me. I'm not on the stage anymore. So if you need to move up a little closer, Raul, to hear me better, that's good. Um, I'm not a technical guy. What can I say, you know? Oh, Evie. Oh, so let's see if I can figure out what I'm going to say today. Um, let me jump into John Kabat-Zinn. 
who is the motivator for this whole series about shifting into freedom and living from awake awareness. He talks about this human aspect, and we spoke about it last week. It's about um, uh, the work of being, and he says, let our doing come from our being. So we were talking earlier about the attitude that we need to have when we go through this healing experience. Who am I being as I go to the workplace? Who am I being with my children? Who am I being with my body? Who am I being out in the world? Am I being a positive uh, influence? I saw that beautiful announcement today of the Biden-Harris ticket. And when they both got up there, it was so refreshing to hear two human beings say that we are all about possibility, that we are all about hope. Did you hear that, Gene? We are about hope. And they're saying we're going to be about what we could be as a country, a greater order of being with equality and respect and love. That's working from being. And so he talks about what this living from being and doing from being would be like. So who are you being? Are you a happy person? Are you a loving person? Are you a positive person? Are you a creative person? I'm an incurable optimist. And I, I love that. I live, my husband is a pessimist. So together we kind of balance out the equation. Here's what it is, living with being. He says this Chinese term is called Wu Wei, which can be translated as spontaneity or effortless action. I'm not the doer. This is something, this, it arrives naturally. Wu Wei does not mean passivity or waiting around, but actually it means recognizing there's a spontaneous action that's already occurring without being conducted by an ego-identified doer. I'm not the doer. The people with that list of to-dos are really missing out on this doing. Get your, get your list, put it over here, find out who you're being, and then do that list. If it's gardening, garden for positivity. If it's cooking, cook for positivity. It's parody, cook, parrot for possibility. So he goes on to say, being is always already here. It's natural. But we aren't yet wired to function from being. Huh. My mother, when I would speak to her when she was alive, she would go on and on about these narratives about people and their traumas and lives. And I would finally say, well, Mom, um, what's their mental attitude? What do you mean? Are they peaceful? Who are they being? I'm not so concerned about all the drama in their lives. I'm concerned are they able to meet that drama from a place of equanimity, from a place of compassion. Functioning from being means interacting and responding and creating from a panoramic flow state where we feel free of self-centeredness and ego identification, yet we remain full access to our memory and our learned skills. Like Adam said, I got my toolbox here. And we have these learned skills and we think we got the answers, but there's a trap in the toolbox. People used to come to the center and they say, we come here to fill up our toolbox with tools. They wanted me to give them the tools. And I said, throw your toolbox away. Oh, they don't like it when I say that. All you need is to be that. A tool means that I'm still the doer and I can function and I can control and I can manipulate. There's sadness, I'll get rid of sadness with my tool belt. I'll deny it, it's not real. It's not about that anymore. You're not the doer. I, um, I never know what's gonna come out on Sunday, so I listen to my talks and I have a family like everyone else does. And uh, they're filled with anxiety. And thanks to a friend over here who reminded about anxiety, I guess I spoke about it last week. So rather than to write them long letters, I just sent them this little video that Michael did on Facebook, my nieces, and she said, oh, Uncle David, thank you so much. I've been living with anxiety here in San Francisco. She and her boyfriend were so fearful with the COVID. They flew back to Maine and they're living in a remote little island off of Maine. Mm -hmm. But they haven't gotten rid of the fear and the anxiety. So she thanked me. I said, anxiety is going to be there for all of us. I mean, and, but you know what? We have the tools here. We're smart. We wear masks. And we're tough because we're not in denial. We're not pretending this thing is going to go away overnight like some people. Maybe we should inject a little something in our veins and get rid of it. Or <laughs> some out I know. I'm just goofing on it. And the last thing is we're united. We're united in a global community. I feel the support of a global community. I watch the BBC News more than I watch our local news. And I feel this is a global thing that we're going through. And there's a sense, and there's kind of a sadness in the world on how poorly we're dealing with it here in this country. Like we're a country in denial, like, oh, it doesn't exist. I'm sorry, it does exist. A doctor stopped by my house last night and he was walking his dog and trained his magnanimity, put some water bowls out for the dogs. So people walk past and he's been here a couple of times and I thought they'd be regulars. And um, he was talking and they were talking to Trey and Trey was expressing concern about, it's sad that we have 5% of the world's population and 25% of the COVID. And he said, you've got your facts wrong. He says, we're doing everything right here. And I realized there was a conflict going on the sidewalk up front and I'm not gonna be a part of it. 
I took my doing elsewhere. In order to move from abiding to stabilizing and from stabilizing to expressing. Huh. So here's this sense of being, this sense of peace. And we're aware of it. And there's a thing about abiding peace. It's always there. It's not just come and goes. Remember at the end of that Mark Nepo poem last week, is it something that we experience occasionally or is it the place that we take up residence? So he's saying take up residence in this abiding peace and then stabilize it. I feel the energetic flow of that. Stabilize that peace. Peace is the law of my life. There's your affirmation for the week. Peace is the law of my life. Program that into your consciousness. Wholeness is the law of my life. Love is the law of my life. Stabilize it. And from stabilizing it, move to expressing it. We need to learn this paradoxical dance of doing from being. It's not what I do, it's who I am. Even Michael said, David, people want your authenticity. It doesn't matter what you say. It matters who you are. People won't remember what I say, but they'll remember who I am. And if what I am is this authentic, loving being, person, resonates with you out there in virtual land, then there's a connection we make. It's like a tuning fork, where heart meets heart, where awareness meets awareness, where love meets love. And then it realizes, ultimately, that I'm not separate from you, that we're reflections of one another. You know, I have it with my animals all the time. I feel like they truly are my children. Gigi gave me a pillow, a nice gay man that I am, that said, uh, my, my kids have paws. And every time I see that little pillow in the patio, I, I smile at it because, you know, I, I, I tend to them. Bird's getting real old and addled and goes to the back door and he says, you know, I want to go and I, I feel trapped on this COVID thing. So I let him out. He can't go down the one steps. He falls because he's so old. So he goes down the gentle wooden steps. Oh, so he goes down the gentle wooden steps and he circles the pond and I've noticed he's hanging out in the back of the pond. Well, he's trying to dig himself a hole to China. He's got a big hole there under the coffee tree. And when you see it, Gigi, just leave the hole alone because he goes and he digs this hole and he nests in it. The pug, on the other hand, likes his stroller, likes plush. So every morning, Trey takes him up to his lush bed, and he sleeps all morning in his lush bed. And when he wants you to carry him downstairs, he barks, and we tend him. And my life has become so simple in just attending to these two old pups and an old husband. He says, from being, eventually acting comes from being, and becomes the new habit, and it happens all by himself, all by itself. Huh, wouldn't it be nice if our habit energy was to be peaceful? Our habit energy would be to be accepting of what is. You know, I live with this little idea that I travel through life moment to moment with Kuan Yin on my one side, with this compassionate heart for everything that I see. And then this equanimity on my right, the Buddha. It just is. You know, things are what they are. And then can I move through that? Then I meet whatever life gives me, whatever life gives me, and say, okay. Let, let, let's go through this together, whether it's a butterfly that we find out in the fields, whether it's a, a beautiful crow with a blue spot. Wu we is about not identifying with our old doer person. Huh. I'm not the doer. Mother Teresa said, I am merely, uh, what did she say, I am merely uh, a pencil in which God is doing its work. Or Hafez, I am merely a hole in the flute through which Christ plays its music. I am not the doer. Jesus said, I have myself and nothing. This presence within, he called it the Father, it does everything. Well, they're, they're pointing the way. It, when we are in our best place, we are expressions of that peace and love and clarity, not coming from the me person that said, oh, I can tell you from my own experience, but from life itself that says this too will pass. When you've lived as long as I have, you realize that life has ruptures and repairs. The first relationship oftentimes doesn't work out. I remember my teacher said, um, he said, relationships are like that, those cookies you make. The first batch never turns out. So when you make peace with the first batch wasn't supposed to work out, well, then if you're a fool, maybe you try a second batch or a third batch or a fourth batch. We've had some members here who've had like five or six marriages. I would think after a while, you'd get tired of that paradigm and you, you try going it alone and see what that might look like. Maybe you want to be gay. I don't know. I'm just <laughs> not it. Effortless action as we connect with spontaneous <laughs> live intelligence. That's the hallmark of an awakened life. Effortless action. Be like the lilies of the field. They toil not. Don't you experience that in the pottery studio, Terry, more and more? When I get out of the way and I'm not the doer and I let it unfold the way it's supposed to, we're all unfolding in a coronavirus time. You know, I feel like when I hear about the plague way back then, we're kind of going through it in the 21st century, aren't we? But we're smart. We've been given so many tools. We have medical science. We've got ventilators. We've got masks. We've got each other. 
We're not in the dark ages. We have a little bit of awareness, too. We don't have these oppressive churches dictating to us. He says, then we gain true freedom and ultimately responsibility. And he writes the word response slash ability. I love to be responsible for who I am being in the world. Not so much responsible for what I am doing, because I know the doing comes out of being. Trey is this most compassionate, loving guy. He, he feels like he's the servant of humanity. And so what is his being? His, his being is this love and his doing is he puts dog bowls out in the front. He puts bird baths. We have like 10 bird baths filled with water every day. He's just like being this servant. The lady came over from the green team. He gave her $2,000 because he was so upset about uh, the trees being cut down willy-nilly in five points. And so she gave him a list of all the trees that were planted in five points. So now his little thing is he's going to go around and make sure those trees are taken care of. He, he's got this servant's heart. He loves, he loves to, to give, to serve. That's his beingness. So the ground of being is not limited to our individual identity. It sees itself in others. And as a result, a sense of communion and communication. We were speaking about communication, how difficult that is in so many worlds. Could we communicate with love, but also do it truthfully? When I speak the truth with love, oftentimes it hurts. But it's so liberating to speak the truth with love. He said, as a result, a sense of communion and communication arises on many levels between people and within groups. And when we see others as our own self, we are free to live from this new consciousness that is emerging on the planet. Wow. And that's what I'll be talking about next week in the work of love, is, is seeing this something that we discovered within ourselves that is awakening, and by going deeper to meet those unhealed parts of ourself and do the healing work on ourself, then we can offer it to the world. Because all we ever have to offer the world is who we are. And when we do the work on ourselves, the more we do it, the more we arrive at our true nature. It's very interesting, healing. I'm going to do this next class called Healers on Healing, and I was sharing with the group here this morning. For those of you who want to be in our class, we're going to do it on Zoom. It's going to start on September 2nd. It's a Wednesday morning, 10 o'clock Central Time. Um, Jody Rutenberg, let me know here at the center if you want to be in the class. It's really profound. I've taught this twice before. Gigi was in my class, I think, because I have her name in the book. And, uh, and it talks about the necessity of love and healing. It talks about the perception of wholeness is healing. It talks about relationships and healing. It talks about there's no one right way to heal because our true nature is wholeness. So it's about the revealing of our true nature. We call our services revealing services, not healing service, because Ernest told you to say there's nothing to heal. There's only the wholeness to be revealed. And when we have a perception of wholeness in our relationships, within our body, within our finances, within everything, when we perceive it as whole already, even though the appearance might be that it's broken, are we relating to the broken parts? Are we relating to the parts that never were broken? Could we find those within ourselves? You know, I was a young man that was always, and I think I'm indicative of so many people, thought that love was outside myself. If I could find the perfect someone out there, that I'll be whole, that I needed. You know, and someone used to say, um, I, you'll be very, wait, no, I can't remember what the saying is, something like, uh, to be very whole is to be, um, yeah, I'm not sure what the saying was. Isn't that funny? You have a saying that was so powerful for you, and then it just kind of leaves. Is that a senior moment, Gigi? Probably is, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, the nature of, of, of relationships and healing. And, oh, you'll be very two when you can be very one. Well, you'll be very one when you can be very two. That's it. You'll be very one in a relationship when you can be very two. Trey and I are very, very two people. And from that two-ness can come the oneness. But it's not about losing yourself with another and becoming a half a person and you complete me. That's the old cliche, oh, you complete me. He's my other half. He's my better half. Um, you know, no, no. You'll be very, when you can be very too. The pillars of the temple do not stand, they stand apart for a reason. The trees do not grow in each other's shadow. Khalil Gibran says, let your relationship be like that. So Raul is very Raul, Gigi is very Gigi, and yet they can have this intimate relationship where they share. And that's an evolved consciousness that very many people can't get to because this, they have this old paradigm that somehow I have to find my soulmate. And then if I tell them that there is no such thing as a soulmate, then they get mad at me. And I say, why don't you look at your belief system for just a little while? If you found one person that was your soulmate, and then you lose that person, well, then you've lost half of your soul, haven't you, Michael? Mm -hmm. And that can't be. 
that we're all each other's soulmates. We're all the one brotherhood of humanity. We're the one. We're all one. So our 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 soulmate is that, that crow you saw, the blue spot that made your connection. You know that butterfly is your daughter or your son that came to see their mother. You know, and sometimes we screw up our relationships. I had a bunch of lightning bugs that were my kids, and I left them in a jar one night, and I came back, and they were all dead. Now, can I forgive myself for my unskillful behavior? I've done that with humans, too, where I thought this person was maybe the, my life messenger, and, and it turned out it didn't work out. And when they left me, my heart was broken, and yet I realized they liberated me to love myself. And from that self-love, I didn't give it to just anyone. Don't give your heart to another's keeping, because only the hands of love can hold your heart. So when I no longer give my heart away, then I can give my heart to everyone because everyone is a part of me. It's this bigger order of being that they're inviting us to move into. So now we're doing the hard work. And the hard work is the work of being human. I think we all suffer the most with our humanity. Divinity is a given. You know, there's this divine presence that's perfect and loving and all giving, all loving, all merciful. And yes, we are that. But we've also been given a human experience. And the humans tend to, in their humanity, in their, in their unconscious humanity, they tend to get acquisitive. They want to grasp onto things that they like. This is the trap that they talk about in Buddhism, of suffering. They say suffering is wanting to hold on to that which feels good. Suffering is also wanting to push away that which doesn't feel good. And when you're grasping and when you're pushing, you're not whole. You're not, um, you're not peaceful. You're going to suffer. So when the stuff comes that's really pleasurable, it doesn't have to stay all the time. You have a blissful moment. Ah, oh, there's a blissful moment. You fall in love. Oh, there was a lady that used to come to church. She had, I think, five husbands. And she said to me, David, my problem is, is that I love the feeling of being in love. And then once I get married, uh, the spark is gone. I have to say, I'm sorry, I can't be in that marriage anymore because I want that, that feeling of being in love, that myth of romantic love. Oh, it's that scarlet O'Hara thing. And once I get them, I get bored with them. And now she's not in common. There are many people out there who get trapped in the myth of romantic love. And if that's what you want, well then experience the joy of that. But if you can let it go and allow something deeper, something more meaningful, then you can find that abiding love, that love that doesn't come and go on a bad day or a good day, but that love that sustains you through the trenches, through the tough times and the in-between times. That's what true love is, I, in my book. You know, when you hold that sick cat in your arms, you know, I think about Humphrey when he had the... Uh, herniated disc in his neck, and Trey was out of town. For three and a half days, I didn't sleep or eat. I just held that limp pug in my arms, and he wasn't a light little thing, and he looked up at me with that one eye of trust, and he couldn't eat, and I put that eyedropper of water in his mouth. I was never so close to a little life form, and he lived. Judy had a monkey that was kind of like Humphrey. She said he was like having a baby. And it's not a bad thing, it's a thing, you know? They're needy, they cling to you. And, uh, and they, they really showed me about compassion and how if we can do it to the least of these, we've done it to the universe. So what if the purpose of all this relationship is to open our heart, to find equanimity, to find compassion, and maybe it comes in the form of a butterfly or a pug or a monkey. Who knows how it comes? We seem to want this Mr. Right or Miss Right. And if you've got that illusion, if you want somebody perfect, they're going to fall off the pedestal. Trust me, I was never Mr. Perfect for anybody. I've had many board members, and Gigi's been on the board many times, and oftentimes I'm not what they want as their minister, and they're disappointed in me because I don't meet their expectations, because, you know, I speak the truth, hopefully with love, and they don't want to hear that. They like the container, and they want me to be more about the container than I am about truth, and I can't do container. I have to do truth. So I was talking to the little Lisa, and she was sharing with me, and she's such a meditator. She studied with... Um, Yogananda in, in the Self-Realization Institute and she does Kriya Yoga and she does deep meditations. Next Saturday she's wanting me to be on a Zoom call for meditation and if you want to be on it, it's going to be like a three-hour meditation thing. She has four different people and she's very much into the form of meditation and I'm not into the form, I'm into the joy of true meditation which is meeting what life brings us and letting that be your meditation. Mm -hmm. So when you have a toothache, it's the toothache meditation. If you're gardening, it's the gardening meditation. If you're doing the Sunday service, it's doing this as a meditation where the universe is coming through. And so in her meditating, to escape the pain of the loss of her wife over two years, she said, when I get into the deepest place of silence and stillness, I meet my ungrieved grief. 
And she said, I'm so afraid to go into it because I'll cry and I may not come out of it. I may not, you know. And I said to her, Beloved, if, it's, if you're meeting it in those deepest places, it's coming to be met. Not to be drowned in, but to be allowed gradually, breath by breath. And you know what you find if you allow that grief? Michael's done it. Once you allow it, you realize, I didn't die. I did get through this. And in allowing the grief, and you inquire, what is this grief showing me? It's showing me a love that never died. Yes, the broken heart was there, but the love endures. And so what if whenever I feel that grief, and I'm, I'm courageous enough to just touch it gently, I'll feel that love is there. Love was never born, and love was never dies if it's real. Now, we've all been in many relationships, and I'm going to tell you, and I had an awful lot of them die when the AIDS crisis hit. You know, people said, I've never been, my prayer partner said, we've never been in something like this pandemic. I said, oh, yes, I was. When I went through the AIDS crisis, they were dropping my flies, and I was in that community. And um, it was a deadly, deadly disease at that time. And uh, it wasn't acknowledged in the world. The president was Ronald Reagan, who didn't even acknowledge it. So you felt like you were an invisible community. Some of the religions were saying it was God's punishment for being gay. Uh, Pat Robertson said that the pandemic was caused by uh, legalization of same-sex marriage. When I hear things like that, I realize we're still in that ignorant bubble where we want to blame some minority or some, some reason instead of trying to find a, a meaning out of it. But what the great gift that that whole dance did, there were many, one is that the love never died. The relationships died in form. I've had relationships die in essence where they're no longer in my life. But the love that we shared is still there. That's the beauty when you drop out of linear time and you move into eternal time. I was doing my call in my office this morning with my prayer partner and sitting on my desk was this little photograph of Vadana Srivasana, who was a woman that came here as a young woman in her 30s and she fell in love with the energy that she and I shared. She wanted to run away with me and I said, you, you want to run away with your own self because I was talking freedom and she was kind of in bondage in a marriage, in a job, in a religion came out of Hinduism, and this freedom was flowering in her. And so I watched her, I watched her flower, really, truly, at the center, and then she got cancer. And it was uh, gallbladder cancer, and it moved into stage four. And um, I was privileged enough to be with her the moment she left her body. And it, it still is the most, so when I saw her photograph on my desk this morning, she's looking at me, it was near the end of her life, her eyes are sending out this love. I realized that love never died. And as I'm talking to my prayer partner, I'm feeling washed over with her love. It's as if she was saying to me, I'm here for you, I'll always be for here, here for you. I was telling some folks that my way of coping with this corona thing was I binge on certain shows, sometimes it's Law & Order SVU, but I, but I saw on the Learning Channel they had Teresa Caputo with the Long Island Medium. And person after person, stranger after stranger, she tells them that their loved ones are still here, they're still here, Every time you do this and you, you, you feel, think about them, they want you to know that they're there. And there was this one person she was doing a reading for, and she says, I'm seeing a horse with a big head, and it's got this one eye that's looking at me. Well, what's that all about? He said, oh, that was my horse that I used to do dressage with, and we were riding in the dressage thing, and he was jumping over the thing, and he hit his leg, and we had to put him down, and I'm holding his head, and he's putting me down, and he's looking at me with that one eye that's it. She says, well, he wants you to know that he's here for you, that he's here, he never left you. And then she said, but that's not a human. She said a soul is a soul. And it was so liberating for me to hear that because I've lost a few pets recently to know that, that they're still here with you. You know, and uh, that what we are doesn't die. That, that, that feels good for my little boy in here who wants to say that death is the end. Death is not the end. You know, and uh, so this is the joy of true meditation. Jeff Foster helped me more than any teacher, really, because he helped me meet that little boy and myself that painful place that Lisa spoke about that she was afraid to go into. Mine was an abandoned little boy that I was told to grow up, to not cry, to not feel my feelings. It was a sin to cry when you're a little boy. Be a man. You didn't do that with your boys, did you, Anastasia? Be a man. Boys, don't cry. I was, my dad used to hit me on the shoulder. Holy cow, I was a gay little blade and he didn't even know it. So here's what he says. Um, Great healing can happen when we let go of our mind-made ideals and turn to face a living truth. It's okay for boys to cry. We admit that we're not full of love and light and bliss all the time as we pretend, pretended to be. But we feel full of struggle today and that's okay. This admission is like the death for our ego because the ego wants to be in control, have all the answers. 
You know, I'm, I've got my act together. Well, every now and then we don't. So he said, this admission to the ego is like its death, a terrible defeat for the forces of fear and repression, but an absolute relief for authentic selves. Can you imagine if President Trump would once feel his vulnerability and admit that he was wrong? What a healing he would have, that he's not right all the time. We all experience such a healing when we say, I was wrong. My Zen calendar day blew me away. It says, when you know that you don't know, the doorway to wisdom opens. Could we say, I don't have all the answers. I don't have a clue what's going to happen to our country. I don't know what's going to happen to my sister-in-law with the tongue cancer. But in that I don't know place, I can open the possibilities. Well, we could enter into peace. We could pray together. We could hold one another virtually. You know, we could explore energy healing. You know, we invite all the buried rage up into consciousness so that we can finally meet it. It's not about denying our rage, denying our fear, denying our hopelessness, denying our anger, all those things that we've labeled as bad and wrong. It's about inviting them up. You know, and we have to start with ourselves, And then we can do it with a friend. Then we can do it with our wife, maybe our family. A lot of people don't want to hear this kind of stuff. You know, it's okay for you to feel your feelings. It's okay for you to struggle, Anastasia. I struggle daily. You know, and that's good, see? That there's this liberation in that. He says, we invite these buried things and we finally meet them. We connect with the furious inner one and we hold him in our arms at last. His little boy was angry at him for abandoning him. So he's using his own story. We let him exist, we let him live, we let him express in a safe way. And we ask him what he needs deep down. When your little girl comes up and your little boy, what do you need? You need someone to listen to, I'm here. You know, Jean may be tired of Jean's little, uh, and Marie's little girl, but Anne Marie can listen to her. Does he feel in love, disappointed, sad and forgotten? Does he feel neglected and abused and abandoned or unsafe? What vulnerability was this rage trying to bring our attention to? So let us shower this precious inner little one inside of us with fascinated attention. I'm here for you. I'm so glad Terry and Anastasia are there for each other because that little girl comes up and you both have it and you can be there for one another. That's so valuable. And give him or her a home and a voice so he no longer is trying to be controlled by us. It's not okay if you speak vulnerably. It is okay. And so we can finally be his parent and not his slave. Wow. Instead of sabotaging our lives with his tantrums, we can say, I know you're upset. Why don't you stop your feet and hit the pillow for a little while, see if that feels better, and then we'll talk about it, you know? I remember my dad had so much rage and uh, he didn't have an avenue to express it. He didn't beat my mother, but he would kick the dog. And I remember as a kid being angry at my dad for kicking the dog, and then I, then I was afraid if I stood up to that, that he'd start kicking me. He had this rage inside. But I realized under that rage was this pain that was never met. We were raised in unskillful patterns, is my point here. And yet we survived. When we befriend our anger, our fear, and all the negative emotions that we run away from, when we breathe into them, when we soothe ourselves with a kind awareness, there can then be a great joy. The joy of true intimacy with ourselves. Huh. And we may discover a peace that is not the opposite of anger, but is right there at its core. Isn't that nice to know? It's like in the hurricane at the core is peace. We're all living through a hurricane right now. Turn on the TV, but we're choosing to come into this peaceful place. That's worth a million dollars. If you can be prosperous in peace, you've got it. So he says, discover that peace. It's not opposite from anger. It's right at its core. The peace that comes from holding ourselves close and celebrating all that we are celebrating the great power of anger, which rises intelligently to protect us from harm, which is perceived or actual. So he says anger is not bad, it's not wrong, it's not a sign of weakness or failure, it's a precious orphan child knocking on the door of this present moment, longing to be let in. Longing to be let in. You know, there's that righteous anger too. You know, John Lewis had righteous anger. He was anger, angry that uh, they would suppress voters' rights. And so he used that anger to motivate courage and to stand up peacefully. So what if, you know, I was protesting during the Vietnam War. There wasn't a lot of anger. There was a lot of concern that we were in a, in a senseless war and we were the young ones they were sending over there to fight it. Would you want your young boys to be sent over to a war that was immoral? No. And yet there were those that said, if you don't like this, leave the country. And so I thought, God, 
you, you get angry about something, you try to stand up in a righteous sort of way for women's rights, for the rights of the environment, and uh, you're called uh, something by the world out there. So then you stop looking to the world for its approval, and you start turning to the integrity within what is true for me in my heart. And then you let that guide you. You know, we in the Center for Spiritual Living, we teach a spirituality that's global. And it's not bound by any container. And when I was seeking to do my interfaith ministry things, everybody was all about containers. You know, I remember I was passing the big Methodist church this morning when I drove to the center. And when I did the memorial service for Mark Moorhead, a gay man who played the organ here and then played the big organ there. And they asked me to do the eulogy at his memorial service. And I dared to ask the question, would it be okay if I had mentioned that I married him to his partner after their 25 years together? And they said, we do not accept gay marriage. I said, I didn't ask you whether you accepted it. I said, would it be all right if I acknowledged that I married them after 25 years together and the depth and the beauty of their love? If you must, they said. <laughs> and so I went through that moment, and it was a victory moment. Was I angry? I was angry on the inside, but on the outside, I was peaceful. And I thought, pretty appropriate. And when I spoke about that love, you were there. There's so much of the truth of the beauty of their relationship came up, you know? It was all about divine love. I said they had agape, which is the spiritual love. They had the philos, which is the brotherly love like you two have. And then they had the eros, which is the physical love. They had all of it. Now, if that offended them, I'm sorry. But it felt good. Well, anyway, so I'm getting on my soapbox here. Um, last, last night I was listening to John kabat and he kind of anchors me in an awareness. And he talked about the attitudes that we need to have to be human. And he has nine of them, and I'm just going to quickly go over them and see if you can integrate them because they feel right. He says the first attitude that we need to do in being human with ourselves, he says is to live in a beginner's mind, to let go of the expert mind so that we're always teachable, so that we can get our ahas from every moment. You know, I get so many ahas through life, it, it, it blows me away. Every day something is preaching a new thing. You know, when Jean got the, the butterflies from her garden and put them in a jar, and I saw this interconnectedness when Terry spoke about the hawk speaking to her and her speaking to the hawk. My beginner's mind said, you know, we're not separate. We're all one species. So the beginner's mind can go there, whereas the, the program mind, the conditioned mind says, you're full, you're crazy, what are you? And I love being a little crazy. So yeah, the beginner's mind is one of the attitudes that's necessary uh, for what he calls an interconnectedness with all life. When we know we're interconnected, next week we're going to be talking about the work of love and to know that we're all connected in this beautiful dance together. So when we have the beginner's mind, we're not superior to the mind of a whale. Then he says to live in non-judgment. The first thing we judge mostly is ourselves, or we judge something out there. But to observe the judging mind when it arises, ah, and, and to not live in it. There is a judgmental thought, but I am not going to live in judgment, because then that makes them wrong and me right. Trey and I are having these discussions about certain political parties, and if we know that they're one or the other, and I said, can we not judge them by what we perceive as, as their political party or their religious orientation or their judgment around gays, and just meet them over a sausage and egg biscuit and mm -hmm. have a conversation, not about something that's so big. I don't like living in the judgmental mind. He said, it's not the place to be. It's just the third thing is to live in acceptance, to accept life as it is. We did a class here by Jeff Foster called The Deepest Acceptance. No matter what is arising in your life, like Teresa's sister has tongue cancer, the deepest acceptance says it's already been accepted in consciousness, so can then I meet what is with equanimity and with compassion. Equanimity means it just is, and compassion means I'm going to touch it with intimate, loving arms. That's acceptance, to live in life with acceptance. I studied with a sadguru, and he says, you in America, you use that word love way too flippantly. And he says, love oftentimes is attachment, a projection. He says, but true love is accepting what is and accepting each other as we are. That's true love, is acceptance. Now, that's a powerful idea, to live with that. The third one is, the fourth one is, is the, the power of letting go. These are the attitudes. Now, he says, oftentimes people can't let go of something, so could we let it be? And letting go and letting it be means that we're not bound by it. You know, I love when, when something that's, it's a, it was Pema children that talked about, we suffer with a thing called Shepa, when something hooks us and we can't let it go. And she says, the grace is when we let it go. You know, no, I'm not going to let it go. It's really, it's, no, let it go. You notice how free you are just by letting it go? And letting it be is even a softer way. Just let it be. 
There are assholes on the planet. Are we going to change them? Probably not. Can we let it be that way? Yes. Gene teaches me that every day. We'll just let it be what it is. The fifth thing is to live in patience. Now, Jean, when she had the little butterflies in the cocoon, an impatient person would have tried to pry the butterfly out of the cocoon and help them in their sojourn, and that would have killed them. So to be patient, and to be patient as we unfold, to be patient with ourselves, to be patient with our children, to be patient with our animals. Um, I had a little demanding cat named Smudge, and she was my guru of patience, because every time I'd feed her, she'd go, meow, I don't like that. No, you give me a new cat. I want a clean bowl. Meow. I'm not going to use my cat until you clean it. And, and I put a little Zen saying, patience is the last step to enlightenment right by her bowl. And every time I would see her, I'd breathe. And it would say, patience, patience, patience. You know, when you have patience, there's no time limit. You'll sit at the stoplight and you'll say, oh, this is a time to breathe and to touch my heart. And, but an impatient person starts to call with them. Oh, they're going down. Oh, they're going down. I live with that as a husband, so I, we, we balance each other out, you know, it's so nice to see. So patience is a quality. Um, the, the sixth one is non-striving. The non-striving means not doing. The attitude that I don't need to get more, that more isn't going to make me happier, a bigger house, a greater job, a younger lover, oh, a, a more beautiful body. When you stop striving, then the body you have is perfect. You know, and this church is just perfect. I remember we had a musician here that wanted me to have a bigger center. He said, this is big enough for me. Um, Non-striving. The seventh one is to trust. Um, Ernest Holmes says, he who does not trust does not know God. Could we trust in life? It was Albert Einstein that says there's two kinds of people, those that trust in the universe and those that don't. And then Einstein said the universe doesn't play craps. So if the universe is all in divine order, could we trust in the universe that all this is happening in a divine right timing? And so we're trusting that out of this coronavirus, a higher order of being is going to be on this planet. I absolutely know that, if we are to survive. This is our wake-up call. This is our rupture to repair call. And I trust in that. I've always trusted. Then the last two are generosity and gratitude. To have generosity of spirit. To be able to smile at your neighbor. To, uh, to not be frugal with uh, your giving. You know, uh, I love this husband of mine because he's so generous with everything. He's, just, just, he's generous in his service. He loves that servant's heart. And to give, you know, he gives great tips to waitresses. And I saw a, a beggar, and he put a $50 thing, and he's just generous. His heart is generous. And then this gratitude thing um, is to be grateful in the midst of everything, to have the grateful heart. You know, in that poem of Paul, that one sentence of Paul, I'm kind of living from it. It's kind of like my, my uh, oh, it's my anchor. He, it's just one sentence to live prayerfully. He says, don't worry. He says, ask with a grateful heart. In other words, I'm asking for a healing on the planet, grateful that we're already moving in that direction, you know? Grateful that we're the way it's going to happen. And then the last is to anchor yourself in this peace, which is our true nature, as we guard our minds and our hearts against being distracted by the suffering of the world. How simple is that? So I'm going to invite you into a last little closing meditation where we synthesize those, those many ideas into one salient experience. Remember the Buddha who said, we don't learn from experience, but we learn from our capacity to experience. So the invitation then is to open our capacity to experience that peace. Open our heart to the capacity to accept what is. Open our heart and our minds the capacity to let go of that which no longer serves me open our hearts and our minds to the capacity to not judge, to not judge what is, and then following that to accept life as it is, the capacity to accept, they go together. To open our heart to trusting in this life force which is giving us everything we need in advance of our asking, even if it's not comfortable to open our capacity to trust. And in that, to know the grace of God is in the midst of all of it. To open ourselves, lastly, the capacity to just be. To be all that we are. And you can fill in that blank. I am love. I am peace. 
I am joy unfolding. I am an abiding love flowering. Open to our capacity to be all that we are. Not with the ego driving us with some goal, but with the soul inviting us to set an intention to evolve and grow and be more than we are. The subpersonalities are going to come up. Raul did a beautiful song in our last class. And when they come up, we embrace them. Arnie the asshole will come up and we embrace him. Uh, Freddy the fearful will come up and we'll hold Freddy the fearful. George the guilty one will come up and we'll absolve him of his guilt. Again and again they arise, Curtis the controller. You think you're in control, Curtis. And then control falls away and Curtis allows everything to be as it is. And in the embracing of ourselves, we are discovering the wholeness. We're discovering the integrated wholeness of our being. The darkness and the light are dancing. The contraction and the expansion are one. The in-breath and the out-breath are one. The emptiness and the form are one. And we experience all of this in this abiding, now stabilizing, and ultimately expressing consciousness of wholeness. Abiding in wholeness and love, and expressing from wholeness and love. And in this way, we navigate the waters of change in our life, in harmony, in freedom, in peace, ah, and with a smile on our faces. We're all in this together. We keep our head above water. We keep our focus forward because we are the ones that we've been waiting for. Take a deep breath. Give a sigh. <sighs> And now to that little inner self that we maybe have abandoned or rejected, let's say to him in our heart salutation, putting your hands over your heart, say to that little one within, I honor you. I honor you. I respect you. I respect you. I adore you. I adore you. You are the best aspect of myself. You are the best aspect of myself. The beloved in me loves the beloved in you. The beloved in me loves the beloved in you. We are always be one. And in that variety, open your eyes, open your hands, let this playful energy move out into the universe, and don't forget to wear your masks. And thank you again for sending in your ties and bringing them around. It means a lot. Be safe.